would like to thank Dr. Jones. That was an excellent talk and, and very informative. Uh, for our next speaker, we'd first of all like to thank uh, our sponsors and, and recognize uh, Ogden Clinic for their partnering with the Ogden Surgical Medical Society meeting. And I don't know if there's any administrators that are here, but I'd like to ask them to stand. I don't know if, if Paul Schofield or uh, Valerie Kajir, Akira Juski, Sid Heatherly, or Mark Hansen are here, or any other administrators, but if they're here, if we could have them stand. I'd like to give them a hand and thank them for their sponsorship. <laughs> this time I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Nadine Bakazi, who is also my partner and a great, great physician and a great uh, uh, member of our com uh, medical community. Um, he is an ear, nose, and throat specialist. Uh, he's interested in research and keeps his patients surprised of the latest technology advances. He has a strong interest in sinus surgery, otology, and snoring. In the summer of 2000, he came to Utah with his family to join the Ogden Clinic and is excited to be part of its growth. Dr. Bacazzi is a native of California. He, is, uh, he and his wife have two daughters, Lauren and, and Olivia, and one son, Noah. He enjoys scuba diving, baseball, fishing, and racquetball, and is fluent in French uh, and Spanish. He is going to speak to us today on hard to swallow, uh, hard to say, disorders of speech and swallowing. Thank you. Help, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bacazzi. Thank you all for being here early in the morning. Um, really, before I start, I want to go through and thank a few people. Doug Anderson has been a stand for medical education in this community. I really appreciate him being my partner. Um, I want to thank the Ogden Surgical Medical Society. And I want to dedicate this talk to someone in the audience. That I, I don't think there's anyone better to ded dedicate this talk to than someone that is a Weber State supporter, supports the Surgical Medical Society, and has been an incredible medical liaison in this community. Ralph Frizz, why don't you stand up for us? Dr. Frizz. <laughs> Dr. Frizz, uh, many of you may not know, is anesthesiologist here for probably well over 40 years and took incredible care of patients. But I think with the, the talks being at Weber State and the fact it's the Surgical Medical Society, Ralph is just a great ambassador and someone to dedicate the talk to. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what's new in my specialty. And I've been asked to talk about uh, kind of a black box to most practitioners, which is disorders of speech and swallowing. Why is it a black box? Well, most uh, practitioners can't view it. Uh, other than imaging, they can't see the functional nature of it. So most of our referrals in ENT come to evaluate the larynx and the pharynx and even further down and say, what is wrong with this patient? Why are they not doing as well as they did before? I'd also like to thank Amanda Summerall. Amanda was a speech pathologist that recently left to Reno. But I think she speaks to the collaborative power of having speech pathology with otolaryngology. The fact that we can use the best that speech pathology offers with ENT to really obtain accurate diagnoses and manage the patients well. And she did an incredible job while she was here. Uh, next slide, if you guys can just advance it. Yeah, uh, no financial disclosures, thank you. Next slide. So, you know, whenever you talk about uh, a new condition or something that you want to educate people, you all start off with the anatomy. The vocal cords are very unique structures. They have a very firm foundation of the vocalis muscle and fibrous tissue in the vocal ligament, and they're covered by, very loosely by an epithelium. So essentially, this allows the nuance of speaking, the fact that there's this mobile epithelial layer that can move freely over a firm foundation. And really, disorders start to affect this, and we'll see this on some videos. What is the function of the vocal cords? Well, number one is airway protection and airway management. When the vocal cords are open, that allows uh, ingress of air into the lungs. When they're closed, it allows protection of the airway and phonation. And disorders of the vocal cords start to compromise these functions. Next slide. What are the main causes? We're going to go through these in a more, little more detail. But first of all, fatigue and abuse. You see these among teachers, politicians, singers, and three-year-olds, if any of you guys have been through that. Vocal cord nodules, uh, cysts, and polyps. We'll show you some images and how to manage those. 
Acid reflux, I think one of the main take home messages to a lot of the primary care physicians here is silent reflux is very, very common. Most patients will come in and they'll absolutely deny that they have heartburn. I never feel it, I never sense it, yet they have symptoms of fullness in the throat, throat clearing, cough, what we call globus sensation. And that is the definition of silent reflux, and we'll talk a little more detail about that. Acute laryngitis, very common in the winter, and especially winter to spring seasons, that upper airway, uh, upper respiratory infections start to become bronchitic, and they affect the, the vocal cords as they go through that process. Allergies, this time of year, we see a lot of effect on the throat. One of the dangers of giving an early morning talk is the fact that now I'm wor worried about my focal cord function and whether the increased phlegm and the, the wind and the allergies can affect it. And then finally, more uh, concerning diagnoses of cancer or neurologic conditions. And we'll get into some of the nuances with that. Next slide. So what is hoarseness? As defined, it's the deterioration of voice, loss of voice completely. We've all had that called aphonia, where we have such a bad infection, we lose it completely. Increased strain to speak and sometimes tension in the neck. What are the warning signs? Hoarseness by itself is very common. The problem is when it's combined with other things like shortness of breath, strider, pain, or even in cases of cancer early on may not have pain, you have to be very suspicious of hoarseness. And one of my chief things is how long have you had it and is it improving in nature? If someone has had hoarseness for over four weeks and it's not getting better, they really need an evaluation. I, I wouldn't hold fast to exactly four weeks, but within one, four to six weeks, someone should be evaluated. I remember very clearly when I first got here, there was a gentleman that was treated for about six months with laryngitis, what was called a viral laryngitis, and he ended up having an early vocal cord cancer, and he on his own said, this is just not normal for me. We scoped him and he had an early stage vocal cord cancer that fortunately responded to radiation therapy. But you have to have a high level of suspicion because not all hoarseness is benign. Next slide. So one of the chief tools that the speech pathologists use is a video laryngostroboscopy stroboscope or VLS. What, is, what it is is using strobe light to slow down the motion of the vocal cords so you really can see the nuances of vocal cord movement. It's basically why are you doing this to look at the structural integrity of the vocal cords, to record a good baseline view of what they are, also to evaluate uh, little minute parameter changes. You can see symmetry, the way that the glottis closes and opens, whether there's um, excursion or not with phonation. A mucosal wave, uh, and you'll see that on one of our videos, a vocal edge symmetry. You want to make sure they're very equal and they're opposing together very well, and the exact vibratory behavior. And Amanda was very good at producing a very detailed report on all the parameters of vocal cord function, and that, in essence, added depth and mining to our ability to diagnose things. Because when you look with the gross eye, you may s not see a very small static lesion that's affecting the mucosal wave. Next slide. So this is an example of what a setup looks like. It has monitors, a flexible scope or a rigid scope. Uh, the flexible one is passed through the nose and the rigid one is passed through the, th through the mouth. And if you can go ahead and hit the black screen, you'll see a video. Right in through here, doing great. Amanda's great going transnasal, that's the nasopharynx. So she says she gets frequent breaking when she sings. Okay, go ahead. She's that's the epiglottis coming into view. Good, great, okay. And then look straight for me if you can. Turn your head just a little bit. Good. Okay, and then say E. We're looking at how the vocal cords come together. Breathe in fact, they're opposing breathe well. The white is the vo true vocal cords. And the large okay. ball like structures are the arytenoids posteriorly. And he, 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 this is a normal exam, by the way. And go lower. E. You can see the strobe light with slowing down the motion of the vocal cords. You can see the mucosal wave of the vocal cords. Higher pitched, the lengthening of the vocal cords. Okay, great. Anything else? No. What we were seeing there is really normal function. The fact that the vocal cords have a normal tensing function as pitch gets elevated. The fact they come together and adduct together very well, that there's very minimal redness on the retinoids, things we would look for with uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux or silent reflux. Next slide. So let's talk about some conditions. Um, these are things that we all see. You see them in the emergency room. We see them as in primary care offices. We see them in the ENT offices. Acute laryngitis, most commonly viral. What you see is erythema of the vocal cords, a plumpening of the vocal cords, 
uh, the fact that they're irregular borders, and you can see almost vessels that are breaking through the superior surface of the vocal cords on the left. More chronic laryngitis, what you'd see maybe with a chronic smoker, where on the uh, left side of the picture, which is the patient's right vocal cord, you see almost a pseudokeratosis, an irregularity of the vocal cords that could be confused with the vocal cord cancer and assist formation on the surface of the vocal cords. These are detailed images that we can see, number one, what's the baseline view look like? Does it need to be biopsied? I would biopsy that person on the right and then follow them over time to see if your treatment is leading to symptom resolution. It's that kind of degree of specificity we need to know and not just clinically are the, is their voice getting better. Next slide. Vocal fold nodules, you see this in singers and people that overuse their voice. Essentially a nodule should be seen as a callus formation like you would get on your hands where the vocal cords are slamming together. They tend to be symmetric in the mid portion to the anterior third of the vocal cord. And what you're seeing in the top screen are nodular excrescences on both sides. And on the right side of the screen on the top is the failure of the vocal cords to really come together. And this gives the hoarseness, the hoarse quality to the voice of the gravelly nature. This is not a surgical or treatment for this. Uh, when I was in California, uh, Governor Pete Wilson was running for president and he developed vocal cord nodules and he went to a university where they tried to get an immediate cure and perform a laser resection. The problem is the behavior, it's not treating them by surgery. And what they did is they caused a rawness in the area and he ended up getting scarring. And remember we want that mobile epithelium. He ended up having scarring of that epithelium, what we call a diplophonic voice, almost speaking like he's underwater, had to give up his presidential campaign. So vocal uh, cord nodules are not surgical, surgically treated. They're treated by voice therapy, correcting the inappropriate voice use. And you can see on the bottom picture, after three months of speech therapy, the nodules have drastically reduced in size. The problem is, try telling a politician or a singer to stop using their voice. Voice rest and inappropriate usage, and that's the difficult part. We see this often in teachers, and we often will have to put microphones on them, have to have them uh, carry a shaking stick to get the class's attention, because they've been using their voice to get the class's attention. We have to break bad habits, and that leads to resolution of the nodule. Next slide. Vocal cord polyps are more solitary lesions. You can see on the top slide a red, erythematous polyp, and usually from an acute event like yelling at a football game where you get bleeding within the cord level of the cord and then it forms granulation tissue. And this is a surgically managed disease. We go in and take off the polyp, we correct the bad behavior, put them on proton pump blockers so acid doesn't bother their cords, and you can get resolution as you see in the bottom. This causes, you can tell this when someone comes in your office. They're almost aphonic, have an extremely uh, gravelly, hoarse uh, voice, and you say something structural is going on there. And you almost can pick it up audibly before you ever look. Next slide. Finally, solitary lesions, vocal fold cysts. They're a little bit harder to see, but what you see is on the top uh, screen to the right, the vocal uh, cord has kind of a, a broad nodularity, and that's actually a cyst within the substance of the vocal cord. You get cysts in vocal cords as you would under the skin. And it's essence, uh, in essence, we have to go in surgically, make a micro incision on the surface of the vocal cord, remove the cyst, and make sure we don't uh, bother the medial edge of the vocal cord, because that's really where the mucosal wave is most important. So a lot of the surgery is done on the superficial surface of the vocal cord. But you can see in the bottom screen um, that the vocal cords can now adduct on the bottom right and, and form a reed-like function, which is essential for vocal fun function. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about LPR, silent reflux. This is one of the really difficulties in our practice because um, although I'm showing you a very extreme example visually of what you see, a lot of patients present more innocuously. Uh, fullness in the throat, increased phlegm, throat clearing, and a mild cough, and they'll tell you they don't have heartburn. So you're looking for very minor factors, but they mean a lot to us. Again, this is an extreme example, but you can see that there's a large amount of erythema of the vo vocal uh, cords. You can see intraarytenoid banding and granulation tissue, what we call pachydermia. You can see that the arytenoids are swollen, and you can see on the bottom part of the screen how the false cords are almost overlapping 
the vocal cords. You don't see the nice vestibule. On the very bottom of the screen, you see the black vestibule. As it gets more red and swollen, it, it's what we call a hot dog effect, where the false cord falls over the true vocal cord. So in a case like this, we obviously want to cut down the acid right away. And what's different than this, than, than GERD, gastroesophageal reflux, is it's much more resistant to therapy. You need to put them on twice a day proton pump blockers, not just once a day. Make sure you take all the measures to cut down nighttime eating, late night meals. But because this is not just positional, you have to manage them well during the daytime with proton pump blockers. And what you're trying to do is get resolution over a number of months. You can't treat them for a week or two and expect resolution. And that's the frustrating part for patients. They don't realize that this has taken months, if not years, to get to this state. And the respiratory epithelium of the larynx does not tolerate any acid. People ask me all the time, why don't they feel the heartburn? The esophagus being coated by squamous epithelium is much more resistant to the, to the acid than the larynx is. So a lot lower levels of acid can cause irritation in the larynx, and therefore their esophagus does not give the sign of the heartburn, but they're feeling it in the voice box. Next slide. Uh, Renke's edema, kind of a unique condition to postmen postmenopausal patients, especially those with a smoking history. You can see polypoid degeneration on the right side of the screen, which is the patient's left vocal cord. And you can tell that that's clearly different than what you've seen before. You lose that nice, smooth mucosal edge of the true vocal cord, and they're very hoarse. They sound like a Las Vegas waitress speaking to you. You can tell when they come in and you ask them, have you smoked? Yeah, I gave that up about five years ago. Well, you know what's going on. And when you look there, you have to go in surgically, remove the polyp, go down to the vocal ligament, and have it re-epithelialize. Obviously, they have to have smoke, stop smoking. But very common in postmenopausal post patients. Next slide. Very common condition we see with aging population called presbolarynx, or a loss of connective tissue. The vocal cords, as I intimated, have a connective tissue in their substance. And you need a very tight mucosal edge in very close apposition. What you're seeing on the slide is a separation in the middle due to atrophy. I'll often tell the patient if they look at their hand and they look at the loss of connective tissue near the veins in their hand, the same thing's happening in their vocal cords. And they're very breathy. They speak with a lot of air escape. And it's very fatiguing for them. Sometimes they can even aspirate because the glottis can't close completely. And so it tends to be very gradual. It's not a very acute change, but it's progressively over time, grandpa's voice has gotten weaker and weaker. Next slide. So what we perform is what we call injection laryngoplasty. We take a collagen-like substance, we inject it either lateral or within the vocal cord substance and medialize the vocal cord to kind of revolumize the vocal cord. This lasts for about six to nine months and the hope is that they will generate new collagen that'll come replace what you've injected. And there are various substances we put in there, but you can get an immediate correction to the breathiness, they can project their voice, they're not sitting in a corner socially because no one can hear them speak. Next slide. And finally, the most insidious and concerning diagnosis, vocal cord cancer. Obviously, this is a very extreme example of a squamous cell cancer of the right vocal cord, where you get keratosis and complete replacement of the vocal cord. This one is spread across the anterior commissure. You can see the normal left cord is being pushed over by the cancer. Many cancers are a lot more subtle than this. But what's very concerning is a lot of times patients will not complain of pain. When it's painful, it's usually inflammatory, laryngitis, maybe reflux. When it's not painful in their horse, that actually raises my concern more that it could be something more concerning. And so we want to scope them and evaluate them. In a case like this, they often respond very well to chemoradiation combination. If they fail that, they'll often undergo laser resection. And if they fail that, ultimately, we may have to do a laryngectomy. But fortunately, with the advances in chemoradiation, the combined therapy, it's really minimized the amount of times we've had to go in and take out patients' voice boxes. But realize, when a patient has uh, a loss of their voice, it's the loss of who they are as a personality. There's a lot of psychological impacts of having permanent uh, stoma or loss of voice box, and we have to deal with that as much as anything. So we want to diagnose these patients early, treat them with radiation, get cure rates in the 90% range, something for the primary care physicians to be aware of. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about functional disorders. Remember I talked about the fact that we scope people as a functional issue. We want to look at how the vocal cords are working. Next slide. This is a list of them. We're only going to focus on a couple of these, but we'll focus on the first two. But realize that a variety of neurodegenerative conditions can affect vocal cord function. Parkinsonism, uh, multiple sclerosis, ALS. Patients who have undergone stroke can get paralysis of the vocal cord. 
and difficulty with phonation. And just a word about psychogenic to the emergency room doctors in the audience. Um, you'll see this in patients who almost have a conversion disorder. When they're presenting with strider and you scope them, you ask them to breathe in and they have paradoxical vocal cord movement. Instead of opening their vocal cords, they slam their vocal cords closed. And that's what we call paradoxical motion. You often see it among patients who have undergone trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder. We've seen it among firemen who have been exposed to noxious smoke. They will inadvertently, middle of the night, wake up and feel they're choking again. And this is all psychogenic. It's, you have to reassure them and tell them that, that if they simply relax, slow down, you often have to give them benzodiazepines to get the condition to improve. But the emergency room doctors need to know that this is out there and it can be a psychogenic cause. Next, uh, next slide. Let's talk a little bit about paralysis. The most common cause is iatrogenic after thyroid surgery or cervical fusion surgery where the vocal cord, the nerve to the vocal cord, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured. In this case on the bottom left slide, you see the left vocal cord is foreshortened and is unable to come across the midline when the patient is asked to phonate on the bottom right. They cannot oppose the left vocal cord. They often will pre present with that very breathy voice and they have difficulty expressing themselves. They get fatigued at the end of the day due to the loss of air, and they often will aspirate thin liquids. Their dysphagia is very typical with thin liquids as water tends to sneak past the epiglottis and make its way below the vocal cords. So you often want to manage these patients right away to get the aspiration risk reduced. And there are several ways to do that. Next slide. One of the ways is what I mentioned before. You can do a temporizing maneuver. Remember I said the injection of laryngoplasty lasts about six to nine months. So if you inject the paralyzed vocal cord and medialize it, you can get good apposition. You can see on, the, on this slide, the left vocal cord is lateralized and is thinned and is being brought over to the midline by an injection. So the good vocal cord, the right vocal cord, can oppose it and lead to good phonation. Now, if we think that the injury to the nerve is temporary, is a traction injury, this is a great solution to buy you six to nine months to see if the nerve will regenerate. It takes about that long for the nerve to regenerate. If you think the, the uh, paralysis is permanent, that the nerve was transected or cancer invaded it, we'll often do a silastic in implant through an external incision. We cut a window out in the voice box and put an implant in that physically moves the vocal cord over, and that's a permanent solution. You actually can get very good vocal cord function after one of these procedures. And patients who are especially in a job where they're speaking all the time um, are very, very bothered. I, we recently treated a social worker who had difficulty, uh, it was a temporary uh, issue, a traction injury, but she just couldn't speak. She sees 30 patients a day and was just fatigued at the end of the day and had severe neck strain from trying to project her voice. We did a medialization technique that was temporary and then I just saw her uh, back two days ago and her vocal cord uh, function has returned. So you're just buying time for the temporary effect. Next slide. Spasmodic dysphonia is an interesting disorder. It's a very localized dystonia. If any of you listen to NPR, Diane Reams has this. You can hear the quivering in her voice. It's spastic dysphonia and essentially a vocal cord tremor. Um, it's idiopathic, uh, although 12% tw of patients do have a family history of other dystonias, adult nonsense, and you can really detect it if you have them speak uh, long paragraphs like the Gettysburg Address. Mo mono monotonous long uh, sentences allow the voice to break frequently. And you can audibly pick this up as well. Um, a third are affected with other dystonias, and it gets worse with stress or anxiety. Now fortunately, they respond very well to Botox. Botox, as many of you know, weakens the neuromuscular junction. And if you can weaken the vocal cord, you can allow one of the vocal cords to at least have a static area to come across, and the voice becomes much more fluent. It does, it's a little bit more breathy, but it's less tremulous and strained because these patients get fatigued speaking in the day as well. Next slide. It's an example of a Botox injection, and go ahead and run it if you can. Transnasal again, we're looking down. We've numbed up the epiglottis, sprayed it with lidocaine, and you're going to see a needle enter below the vocal cord, coming back upwards and injecting the vocal cord. So we can do a lot of this in the office. This patient is awake, but they've been topically anesthetized. And you can see the needle entering right there, trying to feel where the vocalis muscle is, and it's going to inject the Botox directly into the vocal cord. And 
that's it. You can go to the next slide. So let's talk briefly about dysphagia. Dysphagia really is de defined as the disorder in swallowing, rendering a person unable to safely or efficiently eat or drink. It's not a disease, but a symptom. And there is a psychological impact of dysphagia. If people cannot eat, to, to many people, food is part of the enjoyment of life. And to tell someone you're now stuck with a puree diet for the rest of your life, I mean, go home and try to blend your dinner tonight, it's not a good existence. So we really want to be attentive to trying to improve the situation with what causes people difficulty. Next slide. A variety of neurologic conditions that are listed above, but one in particular is Zenker's diverticulum pictured in the bottom. You need, people don't understand that swallowing is a very coordinated function. You need muscles to relax so the propulsion of food goes down easily. And in this case, the cricopharyngeus muscle is tense and doesn't relax well and has formed an outpouching or a diverticulum. We go in, we will do a surgical procedure, we'll cut the muscle and we'll uh, cut the sac and stap GI staple the sac. Uh, one of the main symptoms people complain about is regurgitation of food several hours later. Not food getting stuck, but actually food particles come up because it's getting caught in the sac. Next slide. Um, achalasia, which is, uh, as I mentioned, an inability to relax either upper or lower esophageal sphincter. Um, esophageal spasm, as many of the GI physicians know, is a difficult condition because it's a discoordination of the peristaltic movement of the esophagus, a difficult condition to treat. And then finally, radiation-induced scarring or stricture. And we'll often ask our GI colleagues to go in and dilate a stricture to assess, to help patients swallow solid food. Next slide. Um, many of these are common to the primary care physicians here. GERD affects swallowing. Uh, eosinophil esophagitis is a very common condition related to food allergies. Seems to be at least related somewhat to gluten sensitivity, and many patients are managed by swallowing inhaled steroids to manage the condition. And then other causes of esophagitis or structural things like vascular rings or tumors. Next slide. What are the evaluations? Esophagogram, a look at the gross anatomy of the esophagus. One particular, we do a modified barium swallow with our colleagues in speech pathology that functionally look at, at the swallowing apparatus. And finally, a fees, which is an endoscopic view. So we're looking through the nose as someone swallows foods of different consistency. All of these techniques are used in the evaluation of it. Next slide. So what's the difference between modified bar barium swallowing and fees? Well, an MBS uses radiation. You can visualize the entire swallow, and you can measure the amount of laryngeal elevation and protection. With the fees, when you're looking, as they swallow, there's a whiteout, and we'll show you this. There's no radiation exposure, but the nice thing, it can be done at the bedside. So if someone cannot make it to radiology or is in a nursing home, we can actually do this and see what the deficiency is. Next slide. And go ahead and hit the... Um, the last video here. This is a fees, transnasal. They're looking as they're going to be giving green colored food. They use a green colored dye and they're looking for whether the food hangs up and has residual collection in it. Okay, they're about to give the food right now. You're looking at the epiglottis. you see the swallow, there'll be a white out on the screen, and then you'll see a green residual. There's the swallow, and then you're looking to see all the coloring left, and you sometimes see residual in the piriform sinus that can spill over afterwards, or ca catch in the molecula between the tongue and the epiglottis. There's another swallow. And you're looking to see if it completely goes down as the epiglottis covers the vocal cord. And you can see some residual in the top right corner in the piriform sinus. In this case, mild residual uh, in the piriform sinus. You see the green coloration on the top right of the screen. Next slide. So I wanted to thank everyone for attending. I want you to be aware that this is a black box to many practitioners, but with the evaluation functionally of what's going on, we can get a little more detail and assist the patient. But thank you all for your attention.